Oh. 
was your incarnation, your mortal sorrow, and your life's oblation, your death of anguish, and your bitter passion for my salvation. i 
the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm when the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn in the suffering in the sorrow when my sinking hopes are few Good morning and welcome to Hebron Online. My name is Daniel and I'm so glad to be able to worship with you again this morning. Um, we thank you for joining us online and I look forward to seeing a few of you in the online chat after the service, a uh, time when we can be in fellowship together, uh, even though we can't gather together as God's body in person. 
So at this time, our God calls us to worship him uh, through the words of Psalm 96. And so I invite you to open your Bibles and um, yeah, we're going to start by reading in Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. So I invite you to join us as our God has called us to worship him this morning. Uh, let us start in singing, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And as our God has called us to worship him, he also greets us and he says, Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So as our God has greeted us in this place, I invite you to join me in singing um, a new song. It's called God is for us. And if, you've, uh, if you were a part of our one night ministry programs on Wednesday nights, um, before all of this isolation happened, you will recognize this song. So uh, kids, I, I invite you to lead your parents in singing the song, God is for us. We won't fear. Let's sing. We won't fear the battle. We won't fear the night. We will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us. Turn back, still your love is sure. You will not abandon, you will not forsake. You will cheer me onward with never ending grace. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God? Neither height, neither height nor depth can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave the Son to free us holds me in his love. Neither height nor depth. Oh 
the dawning of the King, He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, He the perfect Son of The true and better Adam come to save the hellbound man. Christ, the great and sure fulfillment of the law, in Him we stand. Come, behold the Christ the Lord upon the tree In the stead of ruined sinners Hangs the Lamb in victory See the price of our redemption See the Father's plan unfold Bringing many sons to As we will be when he comes So at this time we come before our God in a time of confession. So I invite you to bow your hearts with me as we pray. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and you have crowned him Lord of all. We come before you and we confess that we have not bowed before him. We have not acknowledged his rule in our lives. We've gone along with the way of the world and we've failed to give him the glory. Lord, our sin is ever before us. And it's especially obvious to us now as we remain in this, in this time of isolation. Forgive us and raise us from sin. That we may be your faithful people, obeying the, the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ him who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. In his name we pray, amen. People of God, hear the good news. Death has been swallowed up in victory. 
Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to join me as we sing out of this assurance that Christ's blood is sufficient, that Christ's blood has been shed for you and for me, and in his blood we are assured of our salvation. So please join me as we sing. death and pain Why sinless perfection took the blame But hallelujah For a pardon it would take the cross Salvation paid for at the highest cost our redemption gained at heaven's loss, oh hallelujah. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. What can What love has done with outstretched hands But now salvation flows for every man Oh, hallelujah and Whosoever calls upon this name Will find the guilt and burden rolled away Rise up to their feet forever changed Singing hallelujah What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood Nothing but the blood What can make me whole again?
Amen. Well, it's at this time that we have the opportunity to open up God's Word and to read a section of it and to hear how it's uh, speaking into our lives. So this morning, I want to invite you to open uh, in your Bibles to John chapter 21, uh, the Gospel of John chapter 21, and we're going to read verses 1 to 19. And as we do uh, every week, we're going to pray and invite God to speak to us through His Word. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray that you would illuminate your word to us this morning, that you would shine light upon it, that we can see it clearly, and we can grasp and understand what it is that you're saying to us. If there are things in our lives, God, that you don't want to be there, we pray that you would uproot them at this time. But if there's things that you want to be there, um, plant them, grow them, prune them, bring them to fruition in our lives. We also pray that at this time, God, only your voice may speak and that you would silence all of the other voices in our lives, whether they be of our own flesh, the world around us, or the devil and the demonic. Pray, we pray that only your voice may speak to us. We pray all this in Jesus' name and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're going to read uh, John chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. And it's there that we read these words. Afterwards, Jesus appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, that is, the Sea of Galilee. It happened in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, two, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends. Haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciple followed, or the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, only about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there and with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Simon Cleeter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many in the net, it was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is God's word. Thanks be to God for it. Wisdom is knowing how to act and how to be in a given situation. True wisdom consists of the combination of two elements coming together, knowledge of self and knowledge of God. These two elements increase together in tandem in our lives. One cannot deepen without the other deepening also. One cannot grow without the other growing also. 
which means learning about ourselves should also increase our knowledge of God. And if we're struggling to know who we are in this big old world, we need to begin by seeking God. If we feel stalled in the depth of our knowing God and that the truths that we know about him just don't seem as real as they ought to be, we should in turn examine our knowledge of ourselves. For example, if the grace of God it seems to be not as wonderful to you, uh, the grace of God, sorry, for example, the grace of God only seems wonderful to you if you have the self-knowledge that you are indeed a sinner. If God's grace doesn't seem that great, perhaps it's not because you don't understand the concept of grace, but you do not, or you lack the self-awareness of the fact that you're a sinner. What all this means is that often for God to teach us about himself, it means that he first needs to teach us about ourselves. And sadly, we humans are stubborn learners and we're self-deluded, especially when it comes to dealing with our own inadequacies. So often this means that God allows us to fail in order to learn, teach us about ourselves so that we can in turn learn about who he is. And this morning we see that reflected in the life of the Apostle Peter. In our text, we read about Jesus reinstating Peter, but there's a backstory to this event. And so this morning, we're going to do three things. First, we're going to talk about Peter the naming. Second, we're going to talk about Peter the crumbling. And third, we're going to talk about Peter the rock making. Starting with the naming. Peter was introduced to Jesus by his brother, Andrew. In John chapter 1, we read, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two disciples uh, who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Jesus meets Simon, son of John, and the first thing that he does is prophetically rename him. He tells him that he will be called Peter, which means rock. He will be strong and solid and foundational in the Jesus movement, and so he gives him a new name to indicate that role. No longer is his essence summed up by the fact that he is Simon, son of John. He is now a rock for Jesus. And this is not the first time that God has renamed somebody when they encounter him. God renamed Abram to Abraham, indicating that he was no longer just exalted father, but he was the father of many. When Jacob had his pivotal moment wrestling with God on the shores of the Jabbok River, his name was changed from Jacob, meaning deceiver, to Israel, which means struggles with God. Saul was changed to Paul. The reason this is so is because that's the way that God creates, and so that's also the way that God recreates. In Genesis 1, when God created the world, he spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Then God gave the task of ruling and shaping creation to his newly appointed vice regent is in his image, the human being. The first task that God gives to this new vice regent, Adam, is he brings all of the animals before him and Adam names them. Adam is exercising his authority, his shaping power over creation, uh, following his image bearer God by naming the animals. Because we are image bearers, our words have power to shape. We often don't give enough credit to this reality in our lives or the lives of those around us, but we all know that our words can build others up or they can tear others down, and names are no different. We learn this very early on the playground, calling somebody a sissy or a dummy. If there is no power in what we were doing, we wouldn't do it anymore, but we recognize that we do have a power to shape somebody. We shape others by our words, and there's something there. It's terribly broken, but there's something there. Human beings are not just physical beings, but spiritual beings as well. We were formed both from the dust of the earth, but then God breathed the breath of life into our nostrils. That means that our words and our names don't just have power uh, over us emotionally, but also spiritually as well. What you pronounce over yourself matters. And you can do serious, not only emotional damage, but spiritual damage as well. And so we have to pay attention to that inner monologue because it's shaping us. What your parents pronounced and named over you has profound effect upon you. Even what your ancestors or generations past spoke over your lineage or agreements that they made have the power to shape us, and those things need to be redeemed. Names in scripture seem to function a little bit differently than names in our current culture. We often pick names that sound good or are unique, but with little awareness of their meaning. 
In the Bible, names were chosen because they meant something. Because uh, they spoke about a person's essence or character or a prayer for what a parent uh, hoped this child would grow up to become. Jacob was named deceiver because he tried to supplant his brother Esau. He came out of the womb holding on to Esau's heel. Naomi changed her name to Mara because after her husband and sons died, life was no longer pleasant for her. It was bitter. Moments that so impact a person that they change them at their very core were often met with a change in name to indicate that. And so Peter meets Jesus and Jesus renames him. Jesus essentially says to Peter that my words and my relationship with you are going to have such a profound impact on your life that it is going to change you at your very core. So no longer are you called Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas or Peter, which means rock. This brings us to the second thing, the crumbling. But notice what Jesus says exactly. He doesn't say, Simon, you are a rock. He says, you will be called rock or you will be called Peter. And that's a very important distinction for us to pick up on because Peter doesn't pick up on it or Peter doesn't notice it himself. Right now, he is rock only in title, but title only. He doesn't realize it. Just taking on the name of something doesn't make you the thing. Just taking on the name of a rock doesn't make Peter into a rock-like person. Naming something over ourselves, no matter how strong we do it, will not change who we are. We don't have that kind of power. Our power is derivative from God. Even though there is a system of thought in our culture that emphasizes the power of positive thinking to reshape your world, it's limited in its scope, and ultimately it cannot change who we are at very core. We can shape the outside, we can put on a new coat of paint, we can shape our experience, and we can get some result from it, but only God has the power to create something that was not there before. Only we have the power to shape and create something that was there before. Peter leaves this first encounter with Jesus on cloud nine. Jesus has declared him to be a rock in his movement, and so Peter is going to live into that reality. He begins to visualize what it means to be a rock. He goes out and he rents and he watches Rocky 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. He trades in his hatchback for a Chevy pickup. He even becomes team chef just so he can say to the rest of the boys, can you smell what Peter is cooking? He learns all the words to Bob Seeger's song, Like a Rock. Like a rock... I was strong as I could ever be, like a rock, nothing ever got to me. And he sings it to himself daily. He even goes out and he buys his first Simon and Garfunkel album. He's always the first to volunteer. And he says, even if all the other disciples fall away, he promises that he will stand firm with Jesus because he is a rock that Jesus can depend on. Now, this is not just true of Peter, but also of ourselves as well. You see, when we first meet Jesus and we hear him speak names over us like we're loved, we're delighted in, we're special, we're unique, we're honored, it puts us on cloud nine. We have longed for somebody to acknowledge that about ourselves uh, and it feeds into our emotional energy. But when we first meet Jesus, we often don't know ourselves very well. And so really, we only see one side of the coin. We hear of his love for us, but deep down inside, part of us thinks, well, of course uh, you love me because you realize that I am so great or I'm such a great contributor. We often don't see the true reality or the true depth of our sin at this point. Pastor John Newton, who wrote the uh, famous hymn, Amazing Grace, observed that many Christians uh, went through stages in their walk with God, just like children go through stages as they grow into adulthood. We move from childhood into adolescence and then finally into maturity. Like children, new believers are often enthusiastic and filled with wonderful new feelings of both freedom from guilt and closeness to God. But Newton says, while they have believed the gospel that God's forgiveness is a free gift and not earned or deserved, they have not yet learned to apply the gospel to their whole lives. They are still legalists at heart. They know God has forgiven them, but now they ground their confidence that he continues to love them in their avoidance of major sins, in their faithfulness in prayer, and in their growth in Christian knowledge, and especially in their feeling of nearness to God. All these things serve as a basis for their certainty that God loves them instead of the result of their certainty that God loves them. 
Just like Peter, when we first encountered Jesus, our knowledge of self is very limited. Indeed, it has to be that way because to grow in our knowledge of self, we also need to grow in our knowledge of who God is. And so we need to deepen that first. When we see ourselves in his light, it opens the door to a deeper self-knowledge. And so Newton observes that God often allows childlike Christians to go through periods of time when lots of things go wrong. Peter thinks he's a rock in the Jesus movement, but he can't see the fact that Peter is nothing rock-like. The real Peter is all bark and no bite. The real Peter is big talk and little walk. The real Peter plays a big game, but when the chips are down, he runs and hides. Jesus can see right through Peter. He can see into the depth of his heart, and he knows that Peter is a coward. Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Peter doesn't know himself very well. He thinks that right now he has the strength to become what Jesus intends for him all on his own. And so God needs to teach Peter about himself before he can teach him about who he is making him into. When Jesus is in his hour of deepest need on Good Friday, his disciples all fall away from him, including Peter. Not only does Peter fall away, but he is so scared of even a servant girl that he denies uh, even knowing Jesus or being a follower. Even when another disciple who gets him in the door knows this servant girl, and the servant girl knows that Peter and this other disciple are followers of Jesus, Peter swears up and down that he doesn't even know Jesus. But then the rooster crows, and Peter suddenly remembers Jesus' words, and he comes to terms with his true self, and he weeps bitterly. bitterly. God allows Satan to sift Peter as wheat so that he stumbles under his own strength to teach Peter about himself. In order for Jesus to make Peter into the rock that he needed Peter to be, he needed Peter to realize that he couldn't be that on his own. So Jesus had to make him aware of his true character and show Peter how very unrock-like he actually was. In order to bring Peter to new life, Jesus had to let Simon die. Often, the hardest part of dying to ourselves is learning what exactly we need to die to. Where are the facades and the false selves that we put on or put a front? Where are the parts of our character that we're blind to the true nature of who we are? We cannot accept the name and identity that Jesus is giving to us if we still think that we, the name that we're making for ourselves has a chance of survival. Dying to ourself is not only dying to our old self, but it's also dying to our ability to remake our new self. We can only move forward with God when we come to terms that we are more flawed than we ever dared imagine that we were. But seeing the deepness of our own flaw is not enough in itself just to change us. And so that brings us to the third thing. Peter, the rock making. In our text this morning, the risen Jesus meets his disciples on a beach after a hard night of fishing. They've caught nothing. And they don't initially recognize Jesus until they get a huge catch of fish. Now the miracle is not just the number of fish that they catch, but also the type of fish they catch. You see, the disciples are fishing about 100 yards from shore, which means they're fishing for a small sardine-like fish in the Sea of Galilee. And what fishermen would do is they would build a pen around a warm spring that flowed into the Sea of Galilee, uh, and then they would go around the outside of that pen with their boat, and they would cast their nets inside of the pen to try and catch these sardines. So when Jesus says, throw your net on the right side of the boat or the other side of the boat, he is saying, throw your net outside of the pen. They catch 153 large fish that are not supposed to be there. Now, there is certainly a lesson uh, in this for the disciples as it relates to their new mission. They were to be fishers of men, and Jesus was responsible for making them into that. And as they return to their profession for the very, very last time, Jesus offers them a metaphor for their future work. They fished all night without his help and without his direction and caught nothing. But the minute that they follow his direction, they bring in such a huge haul of fish that they can't even carry it. They're also called to fish outside the pen. Soon they will find that they are fishing for a species of people that they did not initially set out to catch. As is always the case, the Apostle John 
is the first one to see, but Peter is the first to act. John says, it's the Lord, and Peter jumps into the drink and he swims to shore. And as soon as Peter climbs onto the beach, I'm sure that deja vu nearly knocked Peter back into the water. He stumbles up onto the beach and he sees Jesus warming himself around a charcoal fire. Now, the last time that Peter was around a charcoal fire, he denied even knowing the person that sits before him now. Jesus serves the disciples. They've fished all night and they've caught nothing and they're probably starving and so he supplies them with a meal. Jesus needs Peter to know that he still cares about him and that he still loves him. And this is the beginning of the transformation, not just for Peter, but for us as well. You see, Peter has come to terms with the fact that he is not who he thought he was. But now he needs to come to terms with the fact that Jesus is who he always claimed to be. Our sins do not stop Jesus from loving us or caring for us. Even if those sins are the deepest of the darkest thing that we ever thought we imagined ourselves could be capable of. You see, Peter thought himself a rock. And so the worst thing that Peter could do in his relationship with Jesus was to be very unrock like The worst thing that he could have done was deny him. But Jesus loves him even after he's done that. But now Peter and us need to realize that Jesus' love has not changed. Our love may be wavering, but Jesus' love is steady as a rock. But Jesus is not going to just brush aside what happened between him and Peter and pretend like it didn't. As much as Peter maybe wants him to, maybe Peter is thinking to himself, maybe he doesn't know. Maybe he's not going to bring it up. I'm not going to bring it up if he doesn't bring it up. But in reality, that's shame and hiddenness speaking. The want to keep things hidden from God is sinful, and we, need, we can't listen to those voices. There is a rift in the relationship between Jesus and Peter, and it needs to be healed. So after Jesus has finished serving the disciples' breakfast, he begins a conversation with Peter. But notice what name he uses. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Jesus calls him by his old name, Simon, son of John, acknowledging that Peter has not been very rock-like lately. The more than these is probably a reference to the other disciples sitting around Jesus. Peter's original boast was that even if all of these fall away, I certainly will not fall away. In other words, my love for you is stronger than all of theirs. Peter's denial was public, and so Jesus probably asked Peter in front of the other disciples, both because it's appropriate, but also because they need to know that Jesus and Peter have been reconciled. Jesus asked Peter to reaffirm his love for him three times. Three denials are undone by three affirmations of Peter's love. This time, there is no boasting and there's no putting on a show. Peter knows that Jesus knows him better than he even knows himself, and so he simply says, Lord, you know. Jesus does, in fact, know, but he wants to ensure that Peter also knows as well. And there's a principle in this for us. Jesus does not sweep Peter's failure under the rug, but nor does he rub his face in it either. He simply asks for a confession of sin and a repentance of action, even to the point of hurting Peter by asking him a third time. But why? Well, when Adam and Eve were first in the garden and they sinned against God, what did they do when God came close? They hid from him. Now God is coming close to Peter, and the one thing that he and we cannot do is hide from him. We mustn't hide from him, because if we hide from him, we'll fail to see it, and we need to see it. Peter and the other disciples needed to see it. Jesus is the same person that they knew before, but he also is not the same person that they met before. Three times Jesus asks Peter if he loves him, and three times Jesus replies with some form of commission, feed my sheep. And what has Jesus just done for Peter? He has fed Peter, he has loved Peter, he has served Peter, and he has told Peter that he is still one of his sheep. But imagine Peter receiving that first piece of bread from Jesus. Peter, or Jesus reaches out his hand to give Peter the piece of bread, and Peter sees the bread, but then immediately his eyes lock on the nail hole in Jesus' wrist. When Adam and Eve confessed their sin to God, God covered their shame and their nakedness by killing animals and using the skin to cover them. But where does Peter's shame and disgrace go? We are witnessing the very first mediation of the great high priest, a priest who does not just enact the healing of a relationship with God 
and man by covering it over with the blood of an animal, but one who can actually pay the rift or heal the rift because he paid for the damage. Peter, it hurts Peter a little because Jesus pushes for a confession, but it hurts Jesus a whole lot more in what he bore. What will change Peter at the core and what will change us at the core is not just seeing that God continues to love us in our faults, but realizing how much maintaining his love for us actually cost him. When it comes to dying to ourselves and following Jesus, we need to deal with the sin in our lives. We can't just sweep it aside or nor can we confess it in a generalized way. For us to grow and for us to understand the depth of Jesus' love for us, our, con- our confession of sin must be specific to the sin. Jesus already knows the specifics, and so he knew it even before Peter confessed it to him. But he wants us to acknowledge it so that he can show us that he paid for even that. He wants us to name the sin in our lives because when we name the sin in our lives, we put it under his power, and he has the power to remove it. As painful as this is for Peter, this moment is the the moment of transformation. Feed my lambs as I have fed you, or as I have done for you, Peter, you need to now do for others. Encountering and leaning upon the rock-like love of Jesus for Peter transforms him into the rock that he needs to become. This time, when Jesus calls Peter to follow him, uh, and predicts the future of what Peter's life is going to look like, he is a rock, and he does not fall away. He follows his Lord even right up, to the point of being crucified. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. The stretching out of Peter's hands refers to crucifixion. It's even possible that when the Apostle John is writing this, his good friend Peter has already been crucified. Christian history tells us that Peter was crucified upside down because he refused to be killed in the same manner of Jesus because he considered himself unworthy. Jesus was right. Peter's relationship with him was going to change him profoundly at the core, but it was not until he met the risen Jesus Christ that he was changed from Simon into Peter, that Simon truly dies and Peter is born. We only change when we meet the risen Christ. This, the generalization of God's love will never have a profound effect upon us. It will just lead to emotional ebb and flow. God in grace allows us then to, to, like Peter, come to terms with the depths of our own flaw, to realize that we aren't who we imagined ourselves to be, but so that in that place we come to realize that God is always who he claimed to be, that he loves us even there, that when he reaches out and he cares for us, we see the nail marks in his hand as Peter did, and we realize that he doesn't just pay for the sins of other people, but he also pays for the sins of us. He is the great high priest, and he mediates on our behalf, not just covering over our sin with the blood of animals or goats or Uh, but covering it over with his blood. This is what truly changes Peter, and this is what truly changes us. Peter at core needs to realize that Jesus bore his sin, and we at core need to realize that Jesus bore our sin. And so that's why we have to be specific about our confession, knowing that Christ even paid for that, and he paid for that, and he paid for that, Because when we make our sin tangible to us and we name it, we also make the reality of God's love for us tangible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you uh, so much for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love. Uh, We thank you, Lord, that even though uh, we are not people that we imagined ourselves to be and uh, we have a whole lot of self-realization and a whole lot of self-knowledge to come into that's going to take us by surprise. But Lord, it doesn't take you by surprise. You already see us down to the bottom, and you already love us there. Father, we pray that uh, you would convict us of our sin. We pray that you would lead us into confession. We pray that you would have those tough conversations with us so that we in turn can see the depth of your love, 
how much it costs you to maintain your love and your faithfulness to us. And that, that what your son did upon the cross becomes a reality that transforms our heart, transforms us at the very core. That uh, it is not our strength living into a name that you have given to us, but it is your strength uh, creating us into the person that you already intend, always intended us to be. We praise you and we thank you for this. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me as we respond in singing what the Lord has done in me. Let the poor say I am rich Let the blind say I can see It's what the Lord has done in me Let the weak say I am strong Let the poor say I am rich Let the blind say I can see it's what the Lord has done in me. It is at this time Mary Hosmeyer, one of our elders, will lead us in congregational prayer. As we regularly do, the church she will be praying for is Beacon Presbyterian in Brock Township, and the country she'll be praying for is Italy. Our Father, we are privileged to be able to call you our Father, the Father who loved us so much that you paved the way for us to be reconciled to you. 
We have just celebrated that during the last couple of weeks. Good Friday showed us how much you cared, and Easter showed us your mighty power. Now we can live in that sure knowledge of your love and your power. But Lord, although we know that, sometimes we live with fear and anxiety in spite of your promises. You assure us that not a hair can fall from our heads without your will and knowledge, but we still become anxious. This season of our lives has shown us the frailty of human life. It has brought us to our knees in supplication, and that is where we are now. Lord, we mourn the loss of life all around us. We mourn the loss of touch, the absence of loved ones, the isolation which is mandated to us now. Holy Spirit, keep our minds and eyes focused on you, even as we mourn. Thank you, Lord, for those who work so hard to keep us safe and secure. You know who they are. Keep them safe, Lord, and bless their work. We pray for those affected by this scourge. Some have lost loved ones. Some have lost jobs. Some have seen their dreams turn to ashes. Turn their eyes to you. Turn our eyes to you. For only in you, Lord, can we find the hope to see us through. We thank you, Lord, for healing that you have brought. Jim and Henny's daughter, Jennifer, has been cleared of COVID. Maida's surgery has allowed her to walk again. All signs of your goodness. We thank you for the leaders that you have put in place here on, at Hebron. For pastors Darren and Daniel, who continue to lead us in worship. For Judy, who remains in the office as a cheerful presence to answer our calls. For the Hebron care team, who makes the phone calls to check up on us. The elders, the pastoral elder assistants, the deacons and the Stephen ministers. They let us know that we are not alone, but have a community which acts as the hands and feet of our Lord. We pray for those among us who are experiencing difficulties. Be with Hank and Pat, with Jake and Ann, as both Hank and Jake continue with their treatment. With Hank and Dee Dee, as Hank recuperates in the hospital. With Bill and Marie, with Tony and Nellie, and with all those experiencing medical difficulties. We pray for those who are alone. We pray for those suffering from depression. May they find their solace in you. May we be your hands and feet. We pray too for those in our long-term care facilities and seniors homes. Often they feel alone and isolated. Thank you for modern technology, which in some instances can connect us to them. And for those who cannot connect, we pray a special measure of the assurance of your presence. As we often do, Lord, we bring before you one of our neighboring churches and another country. Today, we pray for Beacon Presbyterian Church in Brock Township. Bless them as they seek to proclaim the love and good news of Jesus Christ through their words and actions. We pray, too, for Northern Italy. They have experienced so much grief during the last while. We pray that you will bless the people of Italy and bring them closer to you. May the power of God be revealed and set free those lost in darkness. We pray too, Lord, for governments, local, provincial, and federal, as they struggle to do what is best for their cities, provinces, and countries. May they find their inspiration of you in you. May your will be done. For yours, Lord, is the power and the glory, now and forever. May your name be praised. Amen. Our first announcement for this morning is our online fellowship, which will happen right immediately following the service today. And you can just join that by clicking the, in the chat box and you can join. And at 6.30 this evening, we have Seeking God's Face, an online prayer service, which all of you are welcome to join. You can just go to our events page and um, click the online red button and you can join our prayer meeting. This Wednesday at 7, our GEMS program will be online once again, and uh, you're welcome to join that with your girls can join at 7 o'clock. 
um, click the link. And cadets will also be running this week, which is new this week. But you, if you've got a gem and a cadet at home, you will need to have two computers for them to log on at separate times. And again, you can go for to the events page for the cadets to join at 7 this Wednesday. Um, we have a new program, Arabic English Bible Reading, and that will also be on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock. You are welcome to just join that through the events page on the Hebron website. Thursday morning, we'll have our regular prayer meeting gathering, and it will start at 9 a.m. English at Hebron, which normally would run on a Wednesday evening, has now been switched to a Thursday evening at 7.30. Again, you can get to that through the events page on our website. This morning's offering is for our missionaries. You can also give to our Hebron ministries. You have four ways that you can give online at our Hebron Church website, our church mobile app, set up automatic deposit, or drop off an envelope. Well, once again, I want to thank you for joining us online. I hope that you uh, felt at home while you were at home. I felt that, hope that you uh, were built up in your faith. And I also hope that you'll join us for our online uh, fellowship groups that happen after the service. If you're looking how to get to those, if you go to the Hebron homepage and you click events, then you should be able to see uh, all of the different online uh, communities that are happening. And you can join the one that meets your preference. This week, we're dealing with expiry dates. And so as we uh, close this morning, I want to invite you to receive God's parting blessing. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Please join us as we sing, Salvation Belongs to Our God. to the mm -hmm. 